Hello, everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started, if you would? Uh, thank you very much for being here. Welcome to Patent Boggs. Uh, my name is Billy Wynn. I'm an associate here at the firm. I'm also a member of the Washington, D.C. Lawyer Chapter of the American Constitution Society. Um, just very briefly, we at ACS believe that any effort to interpret and apply the Constitution ought to consider as paramount the values of human dignity, individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, and access to justice. It's the mission of ACS to restore these principles to their traditionally central place in American law. If you're interested in learning more about the organization, I'd invite you to visit their website, www.acslaw.org, and there are also membership forms uh, at the check-in counter if you're interested in joining us. Also, if you'd like to know more about getting involved with the D.C. Lawyer Chapter particularly, um, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. Also, here somewhere is Rich Gardner, who is ACS's Associate Director for Lawyer Chapters. And I quickly do want to recognize ACS. We're very lucky to have ACS's Executive Director, Lisa Brown, who's very kind to join us, and the Deputy Director, David Lyle, is also here. We're very glad to have you all. Uh, now, it's my distinct honor to introduce to you Bill Yeomans. Bill currently serves as ACS's Director of Programs. He came to ACS in April of 2005 after over 26 years of service at the Department of Justice. He spent 24 of those years in the Civil Rights Division, where he held various litigation, policy development, and leadership roles. Bill began in the Civil Rights Division as a trial attorney, briefing and arguing cases before most of the federal courts of appeals and briefing cases before the Supreme Court. He then moved into a succession of leadership positions, serving as Acting Assistant Attorney General, Chief of Staff, Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and Counsel to the Assistant Attorney General. During this period, he supervised litigation, worked extensively with Congress and the White House, and played a key role in formulating policy regarding civil rights issues, including affirmative action, hate crimes, police misconduct, school desegregation, reproductive rights, and discrimination in employment, housing, and voting. He has an LLM from Harvard Law School, a JD from Boston University School of Law, and is currently an adjunct professor at the Washington College of Law at American University. Please join me in welcoming Bill Yeomans. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the D.C. Uh, chapter of ACS for um, uh, putting this event together. They've done a marvelous job, and I want to thank Patton Boggs for uh, uh, putting us uh, in this lovely room. Uh, and uh, um, with that, um, we're going to get going. I'm going to give some uh, opening remarks to um, set the table uh, for today's discussion, and then I'll introduce our other panelists, and uh, we'll start uh, the discussion. <clears throat> so here we go. Um, the Civil Rights Division is uh, a great institution uh, that's played a profound role in helping our society overcome the effects of centuries of racial oppression and in protecting the rights of all of us. Uh, born of America's unique, long, and painful um, effort, its struggle uh, to bring equality to um, uh, all of its people, uh, the Civil Rights Division is to some extent a uniquely American solution uh, what Congress did is to empower lawyers to go to court to enforce the law. Uh, de Tocqueville might have predicted that solution. Um, this arrangement places enormous power in the hands of the decision makers who send those lawyers out. And it places enormous temptation in front of those decision makers to use that power to achieve ends that were not contemplated by Congress. Uh, it is easy to slip into going after partisan political ends. The system has worked well uh, when the division has kept its focus on law enforcement. Uh, the division has been weakened uh, when it has um, looked too much to partisan decision making. The division consists of roughly 740 employees, over 300 of whom are lawyers. Uh, it's divided into 10 sections. The sections are staffed by career people. Uh, the career people are the backbone of the division. They're the ones who go out, do the investigations, uh, write up the memos, recommend filing lawsuits, uh, conduct litigation, 
uh, review Section 5 submissions under the Voting Rights Act. They're the ones who do the hard work. Um, and they owe their allegiance primarily to the laws they enforce uh, and to the Department of Justice. Uh, they don't owe their allegiance to uh, a particular administration. They stay for administration after administration. Overseeing the Corps of Career People uh, is the political leadership of the division. And they're led by the Assistant Attorney General, who's appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, there are, are usually a number of other presidential appointees who work with him, and some career people may as well. Uh, I say he because the Assistant Attorney General has always been a he. Um, the, the political leadership uh, has ultimate authority to decide what cases are filed, uh, what court filings say, uh, have control over personnel, over hiring, over um, uh, uh, performance evaluations. Uh, they have the ultimate say in almost everything that the division does. And they are there primarily to implement the president's agenda. Now, obviously, there is tension inherent in this arrangement. But equally obviously, uh, I think that both groups need each other. The career people bring experience, they bring expertise, and a commitment to quality work. They also bring numbers. It takes a lot of people to get the job done. Uh, and very importantly, they bring credibility. They bring credibility with courts, and they bring credibility with the public uh, that decisions are being made based on the law. The political appointees, of course, bring political juice. Um, they can help them and help the career people get things done, both inside the administration, uh, with Congress, uh, and uh, working with groups outside the Civil Rights Division. And frequently the political people come from the civil rights community and are able to fertilize and invigorate the division when they come in. And for the most part, this arrangement has worked well. Uh, it has worked best when decision-making is based on a continuing conversation between the career people and the political people. Uh, it works best when the career people and the political people have the opportunity to talk through decisions about filing cases, uh, about uh, how to enforce the Voting Rights Act, about what position to take on legislation. Uh, the political people gain from the career people's expertise, uh, and the career people gain because political people are able to implement their recommendations. In recent years, that conversation has been silenced dramatically. Political appointees came in at the beginning of the Bush administration and made it clear that they did not trust the career people um, and almost immediately launched an assault on people who were perceived as having been too close to the last administration or uh, who were perceived as not sharing the views of the people who were coming in. Um, that assault included people being transferred, demoted, given undesirable assignments. Um, and it's continued, and it's gone deep into the ranks of the Civil Rights Division. Uh, in the past year, nearly 20% of the division's attorneys simply up and left. Um, and in addition, hiring practices have been changed. Uh, traditionally, hiring was conducted uh, largely by the career staff who traveled around the country, interviewed people, found the best attorneys available, made recommendations. The political people always had the ultimate say in who got hired, um, but um, the career recommendations were generally accepted. Um, this administration has decided to take the career people out of that process. Um, hiring is a, is a process that is conducted com entirely by the political ranks at this point. And not surprisingly, uh, ideology has become a major criterion in hiring decisions. Um, so this assault has driven out many of the most experienced and most talented attorneys in the division and has devastated the morale of many who've been left behind. And this has contributed, not surprisingly, to a decline in traditional enforcement activity. The other major contributing factor in this decline in enforcement activity has been a shift in priorities, enforcement priorities, away from core civil rights priorities. Disturbingly, the division has moved dramatically away from enforcing its core anti-discrimination laws 
on behalf of African Americans, uh, which of course was the initial reason for the founding of the division. Uh, for example, um, the only Section 2 Voting Rights Act case filed in which African Americans were the beneficiaries in this administration was filed only months after the administration came uh, into power. There have been none since then. Um, the only employment uh, discrimination pattern or practice case filed in which African Americans were the beneficiaries was filed by a U.S. Attorney's Office some three years ago. There have been none coming out of the division. Uh, the only, in, in housing, uh, last year only three cases were filed under the Fair Housing Act that alleged discrimination on the basis of race. And in the criminal area, um, resources have gone into human trafficking at the expense of enforcing or prosecuting people for committing hate crimes uh, and prosecuting police officers for engaging in violence. So there is a clear pattern. And in the wake of Katrina's devastating reminder of this country's continuing legacy of racial oppression, these skewed priorities seem incomprehensible. Recently, of course, the press has reported extensively on the rift between career and political appointees and the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. First, we learned that the career team had included in a 51-page memo that the Georgia photo photo ID statute would disadvantage African American voters in violation of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, yet the political appointees procured the statute anyway. Then we learned that the eight career people who had analyzed the 2003 Texas redistricting uh, plan, which was spearheaded by Tom DeLay, uh, had concluded in a 73-page memo this time that the new plan would harm African American and Hispanic voters in violation of the Act. Yet the political decision makers approved the plan. Uh, since then, we've heard that career attorneys in the voting section in significant cases or significant Section 5 matters are no longer allowed to make recommendations. In other words, they're not allowed to apply the law to the facts, which is something that we all went to law school to learn how to do. Um, regardless of the criticism, I do want to emphasize that there are many hardworking, wonderful career people who are still in the Civil Rights Division and who are doing good work. And we should salute them. We should all salute them. Uh, but things are not working well. And we have a panel of experts today here um, who are going to discuss how the relationship between career and political people uh, should work, uh, how it's broken down, and what some of the consequences are. Um, let me introduce them. Starting uh, closest to me, we have Joe Rich, who is a 37-year veteran of the Civil Rights Division. Uh, he spent years desegregating schools. In fact, when I first arrived in the division, I can recall another attorney grabbing me by the arm as Joe walked by and saying, there goes the guy who desegregated the Texas schools. I don't know if it's entirely true, but he was, he was a legend even then. Um, uh, Joe then went on to play a lead role in enforcing the Fair Housing Act, and for the last uh, six years or so that he was at the department, he was chief of the voting section, and he left last April. Uh, he's now with the Lawyers Committee. Um, next to Joe, we have Stuart Ishimaru. Uh, Stuart spent several years as counsel to the House Subcommittee on Civil Rights, um, and then came to uh, the Department of Justice as a political appointee uh, first as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General, then as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General. Uh, he is now a commissioner on the EEOC, uh, a position to which he was appointed by President Bush. And on the end, we have Richard Ugolo. Uh, Richard served 30 years in the Civil Rights Division, all doing employment work. Um, he was a leader in desegregating large public institutions uh, and opening them up to women as well, including police departments, fire departments, uh, city halls. And he played a re lead role following the Supreme Court's decision in Adirond uh, in defending federal affirmative action programs uh, and in helping to reform uh, those that needed reform. Uh, he is now a member of the faculty at the Washington College of Law. Um, so with that, let me turn to our panel. I wanted to start with Commissioner Ishimaru, um, who brings the political perspective. 
and uh, uh, ask, um, when you first came to the Civil Rights Division back in 1994, I believe it was, um, what were your expectations and what did you find? Bill, thanks a lot. Is this thing on? All right. You know, I, I'm in this unusual position, I think, of having been appointed to both political positions by President Clinton and by President Bush, and I was proud to be appointed under both authorities as an honor to serve at various levels. And I also am in this interesting position because one of my first job right out of law school was working for the House Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights, and we had the oversight authority over the Civil Rights Division. So that was really my introduction to the Civil Rights Division. During the 80s, the Civil Rights Division was led by William Bradford Reynolds. And we disagreed with Brad on virtually every issue. But the one thing that I knew was that Brad was a very smart lawyer. And he had very smart people working for him, folks like Harvey Wilkinson, who now is on the Fourth Circuit, Chuck Cooper, Mike Carvin, who are super lawyers here in town, many others, who are similarly smart, very, very bright people. We also knew from our time on the Hill that there was a broad back and forth between the political appointees at the Department of Justice in the, in the Civil Rights Division, including Brad Reynolds, and the career folks. And I remember when we were doing hearings in the 80s, we would get these memos that had been leaked to us that basically were the staff recommendations that went into Brad that, and that came back from Brad back, back to the career folks that had marginal notes in them that went on for pages where Brad was laying out his arguments why this was right or wrong. But there was a lot of back and forth. And uh, at the end of the day, decisions were made by the political people at at the Department of Justice and the career people were expected to carry them out. Frankly, when we got to the department as part of the Clinton team in, in, in 1994, we didn't quite know what to expect. Uh, from my tenure on the Hill, I did not know the career people at the Civil Rights Division. Uh, I did not know whether they would be ideologues who were hired primarily during the the Reagan years and the Bush years. I didn't know what sort of lawyers they would be. Frankly, from my from my seat, I thought, who would have stayed at the Department of Justice during the Reagan years and the Bush years? Who are these folks? Where did they come from? And what I found and my colleagues found was a pleasant surprise because there was a cadre of people there in the Civil Rights Division who were very smart, very qualified, knew the law well, would make strong arguments for it, and would, would fight for their, their positions. They, they came uh, f with the highest of backgrounds. It was really like being at a high-powered law firm. We had people from the top schools and the top of their classes, clerkships, and, including Supreme Court clerkships, just super people who were there. And we found from working with them, and we learned very quickly that we really sat on a um, uh, treasure trove of, of human capital. And it, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful experience, we found. And we, we uh, took the view that we should use these resources to our advantage, that we should encourage recommendations and we should test those recommendations, that we encouraged back and forth. Uh, during my time there under, under the leadership of Janet Reno, she really, really sort of led us in making sure that we use career prosecutors and lawyers to, to make our cases. And uh, that, that was an interesting place to be. I, I must say, at the EEOC now, um, I found it to be in a similar situation. When I've traveled around the country meeting our people in our various offices around the country, uh, there's a lot of good people who, who have been doing this work for a long period of time. We have not had uh, a change in our hiring procedures. We're still, when we do hire, which is on rare occasions, we are still getting top-notch people, um, and we have not had the similar kinds of effects that have happened at uh, Justice. Um, Richard, you, um, you were in the employment section for a long time, and I assume saw how it operated over a number of years through different administrations and also uh, witnessed changes in enforcement priorities. And I wonder if you could give us your thoughts on how uh, you saw the process changing 
uh, and also how you've seen the enforcement priorities change in the employment section? Uh, tough question. Let me just pick up on something you said at the beginning. Okay. Uh, the division during, I started in the division in 1973. I left in 2002. During that entire time prior to the, the Bush administration, the way the division operated was, as Bill suggested, in terms of a conversation. I would call it something a little different. It, I would call it a discussion or collaboration between the political appointees and, and the career staff. When you don't have operate in a way of discussion or collabor in a collaborative manner, then you're operating <coughs> under a, uh, a regime of fiat. And that's what is going on in the division now. now. Through every administration, change in administration, political party change, there's distrust. There's, there are unknowns between the career people and the political people. The political people, whether it's a Republican administration or a Democratic administration, come in, can we trust the career people? And the career people say, what are these new people going to, to do to us? So there's this unknown and this period of, of feeling each other out. And up until the Bush administration, up until the new attorney general, there, those problems worked themselves out. They, as Stewart suggested, the, uh, the political leadership learned that they could trust the line attorneys, the career people, and the career people learned that they could trust the political people. And we worked on compromises on policy. Now, every, they, every administration, Republican again, Democrat, would come in with their own policy initiatives. In uh, the employment litigation section traditionally filed what are known as pattern of practice cases, which affect large numbers of employees. There came a time, uh, I think in the Drew Day's administration, certainly in the Brad Reynolds administration, that they wanted to focus on individual cases of discrimination. Not to the exclusion of pattern and practice cases, but in addition to pattern and practice cases. So that was a change of policy. It was difficult for the section to adjust to it, but we did adjust to it. And so those compromises are, are made over time. And the one thing that you could always count on was a discussion about the change in policy. And that's what you're not seeing today. There's no discussion, and so there's no buy-in by the career staff into the change in, in policy of the political decision makers. Okay. Um, Joe, in your experience, have you seen changes in the process? Uh, yeah, I mean, I... I echo what Richard said. Um, I had been, I was there the longest. <laughs> I started uh, the last three months of Lyndon Johnson's administration and what a thrill that was to start in civil rights that period. But 25 of my 37 years were under Republican administrations. And eight years of Nixon were very turbulent for civil rights eight years of Reagan, similarly turbulent, uh, and four years of Bush two, one uh, actually uh, were not that turbulent. We had an assistant attorney general named John Dunn that was particularly respectful of career people. But I can say all the way through from 68 to 2001, that respect was always there from the political uh, people that would come in. and. Richard's statement that there was all some tensions back and forth, new priorities would start, it's very true. But one of the crucial things is that all through the, the uh, Nixon years, all through the Reagan years, there was absolutely no tampering with career management. In other words, the chiefs of each section never were changed with each administration. Uh, indeed, during the Nixon administration, there was a career person made assistant attorney general. Uh, during the uh, Reagan administration, uh, there certainly were 
it's uh, severe differences in philosophy and uh, interpretation of the law. But there was that respect, uh, as, as, as Stewart has said. Uh, uh, there, there would be real debate. You, you get your chance to be heard out. Uh, you felt like uh, you were part of it, even though you disagreed with what was going forward. I mean, I was asked many times, how did you ever survive the Reagan years uh, from civil rights advocates? And it was it was difficult in the sense that uh, we didn't weren't doing as much as we wanted, but at the same time, we felt it important to continue the tradition of civil rights enforcement that the civil rights divisions always had. And that has changed dramatically. Um, I'm also the one here who lasted the longest with Bill. Uh, I, I left in April of this year. And, you know, right from the outset, it was clear what Richard said is true. The uh, there was kind of a wall built up between political people and career people and career management. Uh, the, I think the time I was there for five years, there was maybe five to ten section chief meetings with the assistant attorney general. And those always were the chance for section chiefs to meet with the assistant attorney general and appointees to discuss issues. Uh, in voting, which I was in the voting section all the years under the Bush administration, the number of times I met immediate supervisors was as limited as that. And uh, the hostility that was coming from the front office towards the voting section, and I'm not completely familiar with all the other sections, but I certainly have heard that, was very palpable. And it uh, it changed, and it's, it's doing real damage to the Civil Rights Division. I, mean, we, I guess we can get into hiring and personnel practices. Probably that is, I think, the biggest long-lasting threat because, as Bill said, tremendous numbers of the traditional career people have always been the backbone of the Civil Rights Division are leaving. And with that coupled with a very political hiring policy, which never was the case, never was the case. You would, career people always had a role to play in Nixon administration, Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. Recommendations were not always followed, but for the most part, hiring was not an issue with for career people. It's a big issue now, and and to, to see the both the process and the result of this process, who's getting hired to replace career people, is the greatest concern to me, because I think that that is leading to a change of the great institution the Civil Rights Division is, and it's not going to be easy to put it back together. If we well, since, since you've raised hiring, let's talk okay. about who is getting hired. Uh, in your experience there, who did you see coming in? Um, I'm probably not the best person to talk to because in voting, uh, until just the last few months I was there, there wasn't a lot of hiring um, in voting. Uh, we did have what are called honors hires, which each year the department uh, interviews people out of law school, out of clerkships, and the, the, really the cream of the crop are hired. Uh, I do know that, and Bill's written, that that process changed dramatically. Career people no longer were out there interviewing people. Uh, I had no input into the people who came to the voting section from the honors program. Uh, we only had a handful, so I, you know, I'm not the best person to talk about this. I do know in lateral hires, just the change, lateral hires being experienced attorneys coming uh, from law firms or elsewhere, uh, the, the change between 2000 when we did a lot of lateral hiring and 2005 was like night and day. Again, the section had a hiring committee, interviewed people, recommended to the section management, section management to Stewart and his group. Uh, and that continued somewhat, but over the five years it gradually got tighter and tighter. And by the, I, I wasn't doing a lot of lateral hiring, but by the time uh, I left the last three or four months. There were hires being made that I didn't know about. 
I would, I would be called over to interview somebody without knowing the person with, with the political appointees, uh, never consulted the same day the person would be hired. And those, those types of incidents were the, I mean, the strongest, I think, indications of the very political type of hiring favoritism that was going on in the hiring process. And uh, Richard's got Brian Landsberg's book, but uh, the honors program started in 1954-55 and was designed to get rid of political favoritism, cronyism, and that's back. I mean, that, that, is, that is why I think this is the biggest problem we got. Richard? Uh, let me speak. I can speak to this from actually two angles. Uh, I, before today, I took occasion to speak to the one, the one or two or three people who remain in the employment litigation section who, who will still speak to me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> most, and you ought to understand that when I left the division in, in 2002, and I think the others will confirm this, everybody kept their doors open because it was a wonderful place to work. Now you go there, the doors are closed because everybody's worried that their conversations will be overheard. They don't want to email you because they're worried that their emails will be traced to somebody like me or Joe or Bill or Stuart. And so they're very worried about that. Uh, but anyhow, apparently, I'm told that since the new administration came in, that there are 13 hires in the employment litigation section, 11 of whom have either federalist or religious connections. And so that I think that speaks a lot. Now, I see this at school when I speak to students who are going to the Department of Justice, and in particular the Civil Rights Division, uh, because it's known at the school that I, I came from there, and so people come and say, what is it? going to be like. And I can't say that I've spoken to a lot, but I've spoken to a ha handful of people and I, who were going to be in the Civil Rights Division. I asked, did you apply to the Civil Rights Division? No, I applied to the Criminal Division. That's what I'd like to do. I want to do terrorism stuff. How did you get to the Civil Rights Division? They told me that's where the openings are. Do you have any interest in civil rights? Man? No, I really don't, but I want to work for the Department of Justice. Then my next question is, are you a member of the Federalist Society? Yes, I'm a member of the Federalist Society. And so I think that's what you're seeing. Um, what, I guess one of the things that concerns me about the change in hiring, and there are a number of things, but, but one of them is, is uh, goes back to the point I mentioned earlier, which is that one of the great strengths that the career people bring is credibility. Uh, credibility with courts, credibility with the public. Uh, and I think that um, people tend to believe that they are enforcing the law. Uh, they're making decisions that are based on their expertise, uh, the long time that they have spent working in, in civil rights, and they're making legal decisions. I wonder um, what your thoughts are on how the hiring process could eventually affect that credibility. Um, well, I think uh, I think that what what Richard describes is is and law students know it, talk to the public, they're they're somewhat aware of it, becoming more aware of it. It obviously very severely hurts our credibility, um, and, and that's what I was really saying before. I mean, when you replace career people that have been doing civil rights for many many years. <laughs> through different administrations. Courts look to the Department of Justice in general, Civil Rights Division in particular, uh, to get straight answers. Uh, we're the experts. The courts rely on us. But if the Department of Justice and the Civil Rights Division is viewed as political, uh, there's no doubt that credibility is lost. I, I, uh, I haven't, I can't give you an example of it, but I'm sure that's true. I experienced that during the, the Reynolds days, if you'll remember, Bill. Uh, a decision came down in, in a case called Stotts versus the City of Memphis, and that Brad Reynolds interpreted as outlawing affirmative relief, at, uh, determining that was concluding that it was unconstitutional. And in every consent decree that the employment section had, which had affirmative hiring relief, and there were about 51 of those cases, we were instructed to file motions to have that those 
decrees, court orders, or consent decrees overturned. And we were career attorneys, and if it was your case, you were told to file that motion, go out and argue it. But they let us say something very interesting when we made the argument. Because, again, there had been discussion about this, and as, as Joe said, the credibility issue with the court, because we had been advocating for the lawfulness of, of this type of relief, and now we're doing a 180-degree turn. And there had been a lot of press about this. We were allowed and permitted to say, I have been, in your opening argument, I have been instructed by the Assistant Attorney General to make this motion. And so you, it was detached from your personal view and put on the, on the, on the institution, on the Civil Rights Division. It didn't help in terms of credibility, because everybody knew what was going on, but it made the lawyers, the career lawyers, feel better. Not much better, but, but a little better. But you're not seeing that now. I mean, you're now what you're seeing is a, a, a complete change in, in legal position that's overtly political, and it really does, as Joe suggested, hurt the institution, not just the Civil Rights Division, but the Department of Justice as a whole. Um, if we could go back to enforcement priorities, um, and uh, I think we would all accept that it is the prerogative of the political people to generally set the parameters uh, of, of enforcement priorities. Uh, and uh, I know Stewart's been involved in that process. And um, I wonder, um, Stewart, uh, I don't know how much you want to bring the EEOC into this, but uh, whether you are seeing uh, sort of the same change at the EEOC in, in, the, in enforcement priorities that we're seeing at the Department of Justice. Uh, is, this a, is this a broader thing? Well, certainly not at EEOC. Um, we, we were under the inter interesting situation when I got there in two, 2003, a new general counsel had just started. Um, he worked as a, a prosecutor for the uh, special counsel, uh, Ken Starr, down in Little Rock. Uh, he was a political appointee at the Labor Department. And I thought, you know, this guy was going to be a very political enforcer of the law. And what I found is that he got there and he saw his role as being a law enforcement officer. And he guided our enforcement program to basically look at the cases one by one and went after them like a, a, a good prosecutor would. Uh, our, our numbers of prosecutions uh, or of uh, cases are, are at historical levels. Uh, we run a vigorous program. We differ at times on the commission itself as to what sort of priorities we, we should have, and that's a healthy thing, I think. But um, uh, the, the enforcement that we were doing and, and continues to uh, continue to do continues. Uh, what I see, though, I, I see other things changing. Certainly, we, we have a situation at the EEOC now where we, we collect data from various employers around the country on the racial makeup of their workforce. And one of the hot issues in the 1990s was how do we count multiracial people? And whether we, and the decision was made back in the 1990s that we'll let people choose as many categories as they they saw fit. The harder question was, how do you then report it back to the government? And one area where we, we thought we had agreement on was that we would not lump people into a box of multiracial, where we would lose all this data. And last month, my colleagues and I voted on this very issue, and we voted exactly to do that, to create a multiracial box. And this is now over at OMB for a final decision on where we're going to go with it. If you lose the data, I think it's very hard to enforce the laws. And these issues are, you know, they're very dry. They don't get anyone excited. They don't get any press coverage. But I think these things over the longer term will be very dangerous for the future of civil rights enforcement. Um, Joe, there are, in, in, um, in voting, in the Voting Rights Act, there are, um, there have always been two principal provisions, Section 2 and Section 5. Section 2, of course, is the affirmative authority for uh, the section to go out and um, sue people. Section 5 is the provision that requires that covered jurisdictions submit changes before they can go into effect. Um, there is also Section 203, which covers language assistance. And this administration uh, 
seems to have chosen to downplay the enforcement of Section 2 somewhat dramatically uh, and pump up the enforcement of Section 203. Um, it, in your view, is, I mean, is that a legitimate choice of priorities? Well, I, you know, I, you, you can challenge that view. I think the prob one big problem is, is that, as you said, there have been, there's just one case that has been brought of any kind in a Section 2 case in this, that was brought on behalf of African Americans. And I would add one thing to what you said. That case had actually been approved before the Clint under the Clinton administration, but we negotiated a settlement and filed it in April of 2001. With my signature. With your signature. <laughs> and, you know, since then there have been no cases brought on behalf of African Americans. There's only been a total of seven Section 2 cases. I just looked this up. Th only three of them were vote dilution cases, which are the real heart of Section 2, where, th where a at-large system is diluting the vote of minorities and has been the subject of, of litigation for 25, 30 years or more and was the big issue in the 82 renewal of the Voting Rights Act. You compare that to 1991 when I started to January 17, 2001, when we brought uh, 12 uh, Section uh, 2 cases, uh, five of which were uh, on behalf of African Americans. I mean, it, 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 I think it's a legitimate choice to put emphasis on Section 203, but you can't ignore all the other enforcement that goes on. And I would add one other thing about Section 203. Uh, it's very clear that, the, that this administration is relying on the number of cases they file in this area to defend their record. Uh, you will note at any time they defend their record that they've filed more 203 cases in the last three years than have been filed in the last 20 years, something like that, uh, which is true. But uh, traditionally, these are the types of cases that prior to this administration often were settled informally because these are the types of cases that if a jurisdiction is not providing adequate language assistance, there's not much question that the law requires them to uh, take steps to, to provide that assistance. And often jurisdictions really just want to know what to do. And I would say out of the, all the cases that have been filed, I don't know how many this administration has brought, I, I would say most of them could have been settled more informally. That's not to say consent decrees and filings aren't important. But I think it, it does say to me that uh, this insistence on filing is somewhat driven by the need for statistics uh, that you see uh, and is really the, the basis of them defending their record. Uh, priorities, i just add one thing. Um, I had, as a section chief, I never really was sure what our priorities were. I was never told. You had to divine them from what happened became clear about two or three years ago that Section 203 was going to be a priority. Uh, even though I was told Section 2 should be a priority by the Assistant Attorney General, uh, and I had an awful lot of trouble getting Section 2 cases uh, approved by the people immediately above me. Uh, it's clear that uh, in areas outside the Voting Rights Act, the new Help America Vote Act, uh, the NVRA, National Voter Registration Act, that those are getting a lot more enforcement uh, attention, particularly the Help America Vote Act, which was passed in this administration and is really not the Help America Vote Act. There's lots of parts of it that don't help America vote. <laughs> and uh, is the law, I mean, one of the more egregious things I, I, I've seen is the uh, administrations going to court right before the 2004 election, uh, filing amicus briefs in cases in Ohio, uh, which was a battleground state. The position they took was uh, arguably a sound position, but it was also a position that would have limited the number of people that could vote by uh, provisional ballots. And most importantly, and what I think was 
I've never seen the Department of Justice weigh in on any case, any voting case, a week before an election. I mean, that is sending the political message, I think, as strongly as anything. And, you know, you see those kind of priorities. Uh, you see the kind of Section 5 decisions that have been reported. And it's clear there's a very strong political agenda going on. And in the voting section, probably the strongest. I mean, voting is most susceptible to uh, political interest from any administration, but it's clear that it's uh, uh, increased tremendously in this. Now, I, I think it's an entirely legitimate political call to make sure that underrepresented groups, that the people you haven't served well in the past are being served as you take office. Uh, doing Section 203 work, I think, is a good thing to do. Um, we, when we were there at, at the Civil Rights Division, we, we tried to have a, a greater reach out to Hispanics and Asian Americans who, who had not been served very well by the division. We had had some success in doing so. But at the same time, as you're juggling these balls as a manager, you have to make sure that you're also meeting your fundamental responsibilities in making sure that the basic laws are enforced and that groups who have been there from the start, namely African Americans, are being served as well. And I think the, the management balance is very important and not to let it go one way or the other. You can reach out and pull in new groups, but you can't let one group just fall off. Um, let me speak a little bit from the point of view of the employment litigation section. In his opening remarks, Bill said that I had worked on police and fire cases, and that's true. My, m most of my career in enforcement of Title VII was devoted to integrating police and fire cases on the basis of race, national origin, and sex. Uh, and the reason that the, the section devoted resources historically devoted considerable resources to police and fire departments because they are the most visible entities and units in municipalities and state and local governments. And traditionally, if you go back you know, as far back as 1972 when Title VII became effective against state and local governments, there were virtually no women and, cer and certainly no women and virtually no men on police and fire departments and the numbers were, were limited. And, if you go back even a little further to the Kerner Commission and the riots in, in the late 60s, everybody recognized it was important to have, or most people recognized that it was important to have police and fire departments that were more representative of the communities that they were serving. Now, what were the barriers that rest restricted police and fire departments in hiring males and female, uh, minorities and, and women beyond overt discrimination that we're not going to hire women or we're not going to hire African Americans. They were the tests, the written tests, cognitive tests as <coughs> relates to African Americans and uh, physical abilities tests or performance tests as related to women. And the feeling was by these the, these municipalities, well, we've administered these tests. They're neutral on their face. Everybody has to take them and pass them, so they've got to be good and awful. And if you require us to change them, you're dumbing down the requirements. Well, history has shown us that these tests were not predict predictive of successful job performance and that they really needed to be changed to become more non-discriminatory. So the department not only embarked upon a strong litigation program to integrate these police and fire departments, but also on an outreach effort to talk to, to, to police and fire departments. Let's work cooperatively to identify ba artificial barriers to employment and see if we can make out, develop new tests that serve your needs and are less discriminatory against the protected classes. What you see now in this administration is that effort has stopped in its tracks. There, a lot of progress was made through 2001 and a lot of it stuck. And I have to say that, that, that the outreach efforts really began under Brad Reynolds. He said something to the effect, I'm certainly paraphrasing, I can't believe you can't, that a test can't be developed that predicts successful job performance for police and or firefighters. 
And so the department can de devote considerable resources to doing that and to work in a non-litigative way to, to accomplish that goal. That has stopped. And why has it stopped? And we don't, and the department has not sued a police or fire department for, on a disparate impact theory in this administration. Is, and I've, I've heard this. You know, police, the rank and file, certainly rank and file white, non minority police and firefighters vote Republican. So they don't want to sue, sue those departments. Okay. Um. I want to be sure to leave enough time for um, questions. So I think uh, at this point, <clears throat> I will open it up and ask that um, we let any members of the press who want to ask a question go first, uh, and then we'll go to anybody else who might have a question. Nobody wants to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, my name is Eddie Eiches. I'm uh, president of AFG Local 476. I represent HUD employees, including uh, attorneys. And I think that unions act, and I think at, at HUD at least, we haven't, had, we haven't seen this. And I think unions have played a major role, and of course the EOC is also, the attorneys are also organized. And perhaps, and, and for example, if there's a conflict, uh, HUD, HUD was ordered to close, to uh, to close down uh, community development action grants. We went right into Congress as, as a union and, and stopped that from happening. It was going to be transferred and destroyed and sent over to Commerce. Uh, the hiring practices, too, we've been involved on some level with the hiring practices. If I ever want to see Secretary Jackson, I can see him. And, I'm, and, I, think it, and I think were there a union, were a union allowed at Justice, uh, that, that perhaps a lot of these uh, atrocities would not have taken place. And maybe Stuart can comment well, on that. Certainly at the EEOC, we have a strong union there. Um, I have been working with them in, when various questions have come up uh, of whether the, the commission should be reorganized or not. Um, they've been very helpful in providing very useful data on how the agency actually operates. And the one thing that I've been struck by in working w with my colleagues on, on this issue is how little justification comes up for doing what people do. When we voted to reorganize the EEOC, I was given a briefing book that must have had a dozen pages, a literal handful of pages in it that was supposed to be the justification for uh, changing how the EEOC looked. I expected, frankly, a phone book with backup data and justification of why we should be making these changes. Uh, you would expect that once a decision is made that there would be justification to back it up. And certainly, I found far too often that, that when political calls are made, uh, there, there is not the backup to back it up. Yeah. Hi, I'm Scott Thompson, associate here at Patent Boggs, and I was hoping to get a little bit more into redistricting, which seems to be a case where litigation <laughs> is ongoing. Texas Matter shows where it's had a uh, a good bit, and I was hoping some of you could compare that aspect uh, in the post-2000 redistricting to the one 10 years before, where there were certainly also a lot of political effects, creating majority-minority districts, say, for Democratic seats, compared to the other side, say, Republican white seats, and how the Bush 1 and Clinton administrations uh, at the political level acted compared to Bush 2. Uh, I think that uh, I'm, I'm not well equipped to talk about the 90s because I, I was in the housing section then. I certainly uh, understood that there was a lot of in, uh, interest in the voting section of, of uh, I shouldn't use the word maximizing, it's, it really wasn't maximizing, but it was designed at that time to draw an increased number of minority districts that could elect minorities. Uh, in the 10 years between 90s and 2000, the law changed rather significantly. And the Department of Justice's role in reviewing uh, plans uh, because of a Supreme Court case called Reno versus Bossier uh, changed so that we were really only looking at whether the impact of the case uh, or the plan was discriminatory or put minorities in worse positions. Uh, I think that it, it, this is, this is, you'd probably best talk to somebody from the 90s to see what the political impact was at that time. 
but I think that the my understanding is that the voting section was very much pushing the strategy that was used then, and it also served the interests of a Republican administration. Uh, the, the so-called bleaching of suburban districts. Um, I think what you've read about Texas and Georgia and others uh, paint, a, I think, a much more crass political approach in, in the years that I was there. And uh, as I said earlier, I think the voting section is always subject to political T uh, pressures, tensions, but uh, I certainly never felt that the voting section had ever u been used as kind of a political vehicle, and I've felt that the last five years. Uh, I wonder how much, if any, difference do you think leadership makes, either at the attorney general level or at the assistant attorney general level? Has there been a difference from Ashcroft to Gonzalez, or now that Juan Kim is the head of the Civil Rights Division? Do you expect that anything will change? Um, I never worked with Juan Kim. He was there, I think, the last two years I was there, and he he reviewed uh, other sections and other than the voting section. Uh, my feeling, I mean, the same people that reviewed the voting section remain there, so I don't expect any change in the voting section unless Juan Kim asserts himself. Uh, and that remains to be seen. I mean, he's just started. Uh, he's expressed an interest in reaching out, uh, but uh, there are some significant problems that he needs to face. And uh, I think, you know, he just started uh, what a month ago. Yeah, I think it's 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 early to uh, to judge what what Juan Kim is going to do. Um, I. I would second what Joe said, though, which is that many of the people who have been responsible for the kinds of decision making uh, that we've been talking about are still there. Uh, and so I think it's difficult to imagine big changes as long as they stay in place. Um, I would say, I mean, I think one of the, the essential things that has to happen is that there has to be some sunlight brought to the Civil Rights Division. And <clears throat> you know, we've had a failure of oversight uh, from Congress. There simply has not been meaningful oversight, and there needs to be. Um, this is a, an agency that has basically been operating with complete impunity. It's been operating uh, behind a curtain, and I think it's it's uh, long past time for the curtain to be drawn back, and uh, for Congress to take a look at what's going on. And, and certainly, when I worked on Capitol Hill, uh, we had vigorous oversight of the Civil Rights Division during Brad Reynolds' time and John Dunn's time. And when I was working at the Civil Rights Division, we were under constant scrutiny by Charles Kennedy and, and others. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I thought it was better for our process that we had to justify what we were doing. And we we did, and there were disagreements, but at least we had a justification for what we were doing. And uh, I, I, I think it kept us much sharper when I was at the Civil Rights Division, and we, we pushed forward with our policies. Yeah, I'd just add that this, in all the years I've been in the department, I think there's only been the last four, four or five years and maybe two years under Clinton in which you had one party government, and that makes a big difference. Uh, when Stewart was there, there was a Republican Congress. When Brad Reynolds was there, there was a Democratic Congress. And that, that, that puts a lot of checks on uh, the type of policies that might be developed. Yeah. Uh, following up on that, one of the things that I find is, is a little disheartening is that the uh, people who, by the way, my name is Tony Cutler, I work with uh, Albert Noble on a private law firm in When the press and people within the division speak about shortcomings in the division, it is often left unsaid who these people are that remain, who the real decision makers are, um, people who are in Stewart's position. Uh, who were not the uh, assistant attorney general, but who were political appointees that had uh, power and oversight over various sections within the division. These people's names and their backgrounds, their lack of civil rights uh, uh, experience, do not seem to get to the forefront. And I think when you say uh, we need to shine a light on the division, I think it's a little empty to shine a light on the figurehead, the assistant attorney general, 
without shining a light on those who are uh, advising the Assistant Attorney General and those who are really uh, uh, directing uh, the Civil Rights Division. And I think the press misses out on that when they do their reporting and or when people within the division have the courage to speak out. I think those names and backgrounds are left uh, unsaid. Uh, I, one other thing I want to point out, there was an issue of uh, credibility. And I have to say from the private bar, uh, I was hired, I worked for the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. I was hired under Bush 1 and uh, worked through uh, the first uh, administration of Clinton. And I have to say that there was a, 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 a large respect for those attorneys that work in the division and work for the Department of Justice. These days, uh, the private bar that I know and that I associate with, um, there is little to no respect for those who are coming into the division uh, at this point because uh, the standards are eradicated. And I'm not sure why there is not more of an uproar that the, uh, uh, the current committee has basically been eviscerated within, within the division. That should be something that is uh, spoken about by the press, by everyone associated who wants to see civil rights enforcement. Because without career attorneys recruited from the top law schools and without laterals coming in who have civil rights background and criteria, you cannot have civil rights enforcement. So I'm just not sure why that's not brought out more, why there's not more of an uproar about those issues. I was always impressed both in my time at Justice and now at the EEOC of the dedication that, that career lawyers can bring to the job because they, they want to be there. Um, uh, government lawyers don't make much money in the scheme of things. They certainly don't make the salaries that they make at private law firms like Patton Boggs and other firms around town. But people really wanted to be there. These were people who had choices to where they wanted to go. And they, they chose to come to the government. They chose to come to the Department of Justice to, to be a litigator. And they were enforcing laws that they believed in. And there, there, there are times when you would differ with the political leadership on what the enforcement should look like, but they basically enforce the law. And I thought that was a huge strength that I found when I was at Justice and that I continue to find today at the EEOC. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree with you more that the hiring is, is essential. I mean, it's a, it's a huge part of this story. And I think that the, um, the weakening of the career core of attorneys uh, is the most destructive thing that's going on in the Civil Rights Division. Well, I, I think Richard's point about people not knowing where they were going to go and just were placed there, I think, is, is telling. Because yeah. people want, certainly when I was there at the Civil Rights Division, people wanted to come to the Civil Rights Division. This was their first choice, maybe their only choice. They didn't want to be an antitrust lawyer. They didn't want to be a, a regular criminal prosecutor. They didn't want to do environmental law, they wanted to do civil rights law. And and it was the, really the premier place in the country to do civil rights law. And for me, it was quite an honor to be there because I knew that I couldn't be hired by the honors program, given that. <laughs> yeah. Can you comment on the story that I heard about um, sort of gag rules that you couldn't talk to, the appellate section couldn't talk to the different trial sections and the trial sections and the appellate sections couldn't talk to the SG's office. Um, I find that very disturbing. It makes it very difficult to make good decisions if you're not discussing the issues. Um, I, again, not the best person to answer this because I think the appellate section lawyers, I, I do know the appellate section has been through as much turmoil as any section in the division. Uh, part, in part, uh, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see the statistics of the number of people who have left or transferred either willingly or not. I think it would be well over 50 percent. Um, part of the problem there is 60 percent of their time, I think, is reported uh, to Congress by, by Juan Kim at his confirmation hearings were, were spent on immigration cases. Uh, which the department has been divvying up to different divisions because there's a, a great increased need. But it's being used in the Civil Rights Division to punish people that are not uh, viewed as loyal. And uh, it's the morale as a result is very low. As far as your question goes, 
Uh, I can't say I was aware of any gag order. Uh, I know that the, the voting section had very few appeals the last two or three years I was there, so I, I, I used to talk to the people in the appellate section a lot, just generally about any possibility of amicus briefs, which there wasn't. Um, but, uh, you know, early on there were a couple of appeals, and uh, I don't recall, I mean, this is about 2002, maybe 2003, uh, 2001. I don't recall any gag order. We had a pretty good back and forth with the appellate section, but it was always understood that once that brief got to the front office, uh, it was going to be, you didn't know what was going to happen to it. Yeah, I'm, I think the, the, the appellate section has suffered uh, as much, maybe more than any other section, uh, in terms of, of what's been happening to the career lawyers. Um, as Joe pointed out, the uh, I think it's actually 60%, over 60% of the substantive filings in court um, last year were in immigration matters. 60%? Over 60%. And these are deportation orders. So what you're doing is asking civil rights attorneys uh, to defend the government's orders to deport someone out of the country. Uh, and those assignments are being used punitively. Um, they, those cases are being assigned um, not on a random basis. They're being assigned to people uh, who are disfavored. And there are attorneys in the appellate section who are no longer allowed to work on civil rights matters. They work exclusively on immigration matters. And these are people who have been there for, for decades, who are experienced appellate litigators, who know the civil rights laws better than anybody. Uh, it's an en enormous waste of resources uh, and um, uh, just a, a terrible diversion and it's driven out uh, many of the best people. Um, there have been at least one involuntary transfer. Um, a number of other people have simply left. And the ones who are there who are receiving a steady diet of immigration cases are demoralized. Yeah. I'm Diane Pichet, Citizens Commission on Civil Rights. Everybody. Uh, this is very, very helpful, so I want to thank the panel. I have, a, I have two questions. Um, one is with respect to the employment practices, including punishing employees, moving them around, that sort of thing, uh, what sort of redress or, or grievance processes have been used? <coughs> what might be available? Uh, the gentleman from the union mentioned the possibility of unionizing has that been attempted? That's one question. The second question I have is you provided us with very useful information about most of the sections. Um, one of my principal areas of interest is in education. Um, I was wondering if anybody on the panel has any uh, first-hand knowledge about what has happened in education. My sense is <coughs> almost nothing is happening in education and even less in the second Bush term than the first. This is George W. Um, and, and, and that that coupled with the incompetence at the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education and the new Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights and Education means that we really don't have any place in the federal government where we have anywhere near adequate enforcement of civil rights laws in education, which is you know, a very interesting issue given that this, that this president would really like to be on domestic issues, you know, um, as to your first question about the transfers, I, I think that the drain of people, which has been severe, particularly the last year, just for an example, I left the voting section in April with a number of other people in April, and since then, I think there's now a total of 12 out of 36 lawyers who have either left or transferred. Now these transfers for the most part are not uh, involuntary. It's, it, many of them are people that morale is so bad in certain sections, and voting is one of them, that they will try to get transferred to another section where they feel that the pressure won't be so bad. There have been involuntary transfers. Uh, there is a grievance procedure in the Department of Justice that uh, I think one of the attorneys who, who uh, was involuntary transferred has uh, filed a complaint. Uh, so there are things in place to do it. 
Hey, Joe, that that's separate from the EEO grievance procedures, right? Is it a e well, there's the EEO grievance procedures, but there's also a grievance procedure just for, say, an evaluation, uh, that type of thing. So there are there are certain uh, remedies out there if you can work your way through them. But it's very it's very difficult yeah. to to, find, to to succeed on a grievance unless you can put it into the EEO box, and <clears throat> many of these simply don't fit into that box. Um, the other the other grievance procedures are basically um, appeals to political appointees in the chain and um, are rarely successful. Um, Let me your just point address on the education. Oh, okay. First, uh, I can say, say that that's probably a section that that has not been touched very much by this. At the same time, your observation that there's not a lot of enforcement there, I think, is also true. Uh, there are certain areas where I think there, that there have been efforts. They've brought, I, I think, a few uh, religious discrimination cases. Uh, uh, but overall, uh, the enforcement <coughs> level has not has stayed very low. And as a result, there is not a lot of, uh, uh, of political turmoil in that section. Yes. I'm Sarah Pratt. I'm a former career employee at HUD. In the early administration, in the days of this administration, the word came down that a political appointee from the Department of Justice went to HUD and said that the Department of Justice would not litigate uh, cases referred by HUD that involved uh, the disparate impact theory, regardless of the state of the facts, regardless of the state of the law in the circuit. Um, has that uh, issue, has the disparate impact issue continued to be an issue at the Department of Justice? Um, and is it, uh, is there any precedent for a political appointee to take the position that a particular theory that's well established in law will not be pursued in litigation? Uh, well, the, an the answer is that there is precedent, yes. <laughs> and it's, it, it was done under the Fair Housing Act during the Reagan years, uh, even though the circuits were pretty unanimous at that point. Um, but um, you know, there's the, I, Richard touched on the point about uh, disparate impact in employment. I think disparate impact, the disparate impact theory across the board, is disfavored. Um, but I don't, I don't have firsthand knowledge about what's happening there any in housing. Disparate impact cases. There, the employment section filed one disparate impact case against Erie, Pennsylvania, on on behalf of female applicants for the fire department. That's the only one that's been filed. In fact, I understand that the decision came down yesterday and the government prevailed. So, but beyond that, that was the traditional type of case filed by the Civil Rights Division, certainly by the Employment Litigation Section. Uh, over time, the Civil the Employment Section filed roughly 14 cases a year and roughly broken down 10 individual cases, four disparate impact cases. There's been one disparate impact case filed since two, January 20th, 2001. So I think the numbers speak for themselves. Yeah, I would add that I think this issue has always been a sensitive issue for decades. Uh, the conservatives generally uh, are fighting a disparate impact uh, theory, uh, whereas Democrats are very much pushing disparate impact as uh, necessary to enforce civil rights laws. Uh, so that this this debate's been around. I I did, was not aware of anybody going over and talking to HUD uh, in that manner because I never saw that before when I was in the housing section. But uh, I think it explains partly explains why there are uh, such a drop off in Section Two cases. As I said, only three cases have been brought. Uh, vote dilution cases, and those are brought pursuant to what's called the results test, which is is essentially a disparate impact but not quite uh, test. And I think the reluctance to bring these kind of cases reflects a uh, reluctance to use disparate impact as a basis for enforcing civil rights. Let me make one further point about it. I mean, this it's not just an academic exercise talking about disparate impact cases. 
the Department of Justice, at least in the employment setting, and I think otherwise, is uniquely situated to bring these cases because these are expensive cases to bring, which require go on for a long time, require a lot of discovery and lots and lots of expert witnesses. And there are virtually no private plaintiffs or organizations that have the resources and the expertise to bring these cases. So if the Department of Justice doesn't bring these cases, they're not brought. And that's what that's the problem. There's no organization that's, stand, that's saying to employers, state and local government employers, where the Justice Department has authority or jurisdiction in the private sector, you need to look and evaluate your employment practices. And I think what you're seeing is regression and not, not progress being made. And to me, that's a very difficult uh, proposition to accept. Yeah, it's also true of Section 2 cases. They're amongst the most complex cases to bring. And it's, that's why it's so important for the government with its resources to be active in that area. We have time for one last question. Oh, sorry. Anybody else have one? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Bill, a question for you or any of your colleagues. Have you seen a, a similar change, similar reduction in the uh, vigor of prosecution of hate crimes? Uh, there has been a reduction in the prosecution of hate crimes. And in part, that's. Um, it's a result of a lot more resources being put into human trafficking prosecutions. Um, so um, given the finite resources of the section, um, uh, those cases are eating up the resources. Hate crime prosecutions are down. Uh, police misconduct prosecutions are dropping. Uh, and I think you'll see further decreases uh, in those areas. Um, just, you know, on, on numbers, though, I, you know, I, I, I do want to put out a quick caution about numbers uh, because you know people can argue numbers different ways uh, and whenever somebody up here says a number then the Department of Justice says a different number and and, and it's confusing um, but just to put the numbers in perspective at the very most it seems the department is arguing that in certain areas they're doing as well as uh, the Clinton administration does but if you look at the budget you realize um, that Oh, going back to say 1999, since 1999, I think 150 employees have been added to the Civil Rights Division. So simply uh, staying at the same level uh, is failure, I think. Um, so I just add that as a matter of perspective. Um, anybody have want to make a have a last word? Okay. Um, Billy? I just, I just want to ask one question. I'm sure. Sorry. Um, take five minutes. I, I just want to get to the question of why this is happening. And I, it's probably going to involve some speculation, but I just feel like it needs to be asked. I mean, we've talked about you know, chilling of enforcement activities. We've talked about recruitment of people who are not committed to civil rights. We've talked about pressure on people who are committed to civil rights to leave the agency. And certainly, I'm sure some of it has to do with a genuine intellectual disagreement about the interpretation of these laws, but I feel like there has to be more than that going on. And like I said, it's going to involve some speculation, but part of my concern is that you know, there's a strain of thought shared by some conservatives, certainly not all, that, hey, it's the year 2005. You know, to the extent that racism and sexism still exists, it's just not that big of a deal. I, I just hope that maybe I can get a little bit of a comment from you all on that question. Anybody want to start? There you go. <laughs> Why are you looking down this <laughs> way? <laughs> uh, I have my my own theories, my own theory, and my theory is that the Reagan administration had the same agenda but failed, and that that agenda was to to turn back, to get rid of the disparate impact theory, and focus on intentional discrimination. And what they mean by intentional discrimination is absolutely overt. Discrimination—it's got to slap you in the face against individual victims and individual victims yeah. and identifiable, so, victims. identifiable individual victims who have been slapped in the face, okay, <laughs> and, and, uh, or as close to slapping in the face as possible. And they realized at the end of eight years in of the Reagan administration that they had essentially failed in doing that, and the reason they failed is because. The, the career attorneys remained in place. And that the career attorneys had a different agenda than, than they had. Well, the career attorneys correctly implemented the Reagan agenda, 
they were there to then implement another agenda when uh, there was a change in administration. And as I think Stewart suggested, or Joe suggested, the Dunn administration, the, the first Bush administration with John Dunn as the Assistant Attorney General, was much more moderate than, than the, the, the Reagan administration. So the careerists were in place, and they were in place when Clinton came in, and you were hiring the same type of people, people who had genuine interest in civil rights. Now, if you want to make change, it's something called, what my wife calls, institutional change. And what you're seeing is institutional change. So when there's a change in administration, the careerists will not be implementing a more, a, a different, li more liberal uh, agenda. And I think that's essentially what you're seeing. You also see, I think, a, uh, a, an attack on the infrastructure that you need to do civil rights enforcement. I talked earlier about the data issue and using, collecting data on multiracial people. And the argument that we get back, that I get back so often, is that there are so few multiracial people out there. You know, there will be more over the years, but you know, my kids right now really don't count because they're, they're too small. But we looked at this from the flip side. You know, what does it mean for various groups involved? And, you know, multiracial people constitute 54% of the native Hawaiian population. 40% of the American Indian population, 14% of the Asian population, and 5% of the black population. These are not insignificant numbers of people who will be impacted because we don't collect the data for these for these groups, that the data will get lost and will get lost forever. It's not something you can recreate later. Uh, and I think that in the long run is very dangerous, that, that whoever is doing this in the future won't have the tools to do it, yet discrimination will still go on. It will go on, on under various guises. You know, the, the other dangerous thing that I find is that quite often, and certainly now at the EEOC, much of our enforcement is, is against the blatant violator. And these are all bad cases, you know, bad sexual harassment cases, bad race cases, muses, epithets, all that. But there's also a whole area of much more subtle, sophisticated type of discrimination that are keeping people out of jobs at all levels. And that's something that I, I've been pushing the EEOC to do more work in, something that I think if we're going to get to the bottom of, of discrimination and fully enforce the anti-discrimination laws, you can't just look at the easy, stark cases. You have to go over, uh, go after the very, very sophisticated ones as well. I'd just add a couple thoughts. Um, I think Richard touched on it, that, that basically starting particularly in the Reagan years, uh, the, Rep the Republican Party, the conservative wing particularly, pushed so hard a colorblind approach to civil rights enforcement, which was antithetical to the direction that civil rights uh, law interpretation had been going until then. And it's been picked up again in this administration. And I think if, if your view is that colorblind, have to prove intentional discrimination, there is going to be a lot less concern about civil rights enforcement. I think that that's from a philosophical view. I think, uh, you know, more directly, I think that I always felt that the Department of Justice, uh, once Bush was elected, was given over to the right wing. Uh, Ashcroft became the Attorney General, and it had a uh, it had a group of people at uh, a level be be below the Assistant Attorney General level that were very much from that school, and uh, you know wh whether it, it's throughout the government, I always felt Department of Justice as an institution and Civil Rights Division in particular were affected by that. All right. Join me in thanking our panel.